uh, Sergey. Um, I'm Rico Pang from uh, Fighter Protocol. Um, I'm also uh, the co-founder and managing partner of uh, Sanctum Global Ventures. Uh, we have about the 500 million uh, AUM fund that we are investing into the uh, tech ecosystems, uh, not limiting to IoT, um, FinTech, um, artificial intelligence, smart cities tech, uh, map tech, agricultural tech, and so on and so forth. Um, we are here uh, to actually, uh, we're very honored to be invited here to speak about some of these uh, um, developments that we have involved in the digital economy and infrastructures. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to uh, have a very great uh, speakers on the panel today. Um, let's uh, have a self-introduction from uh, Lizzie Chapman. So, oh, hi, I'm Lizzie. Um, I'm hi. here in Bangalore. Uh, I am the co-founder and CEO of a fintech company called Zest Money. We're based in India. Uh, and we are one of the largest digital consumer lending companies in the market uh, and the leading POS finance company online in India. So we help people afford online shopping uh, by providing a point of sale credit product. Uh, I've been working in India for about eight and a half years. Before this, I was working on a digital bank with DBS in Singapore for the India market. Um, and before that, for a UK company called Wonga, who was one of the biggest digital lenders many years back. So excited to be here um, and have a good conversation about infrastructure and digital rails uh, to provide better financial inclusion and financial services. I think... Prashant, you're the next. Your Prashant, you're next, yeah. Yeah, it will be good. So, hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, it's really a wonderful event. I'm really glad to see such a wonderful uh, panel. So I'm Prashant Surana Jain. Uh, I'm co-founder of uh, Snapper Future Tech and uh, also an early stage uh, investor with a couple of funds uh, in India and the US. So uh, I'm co-founder of Snapper. Snapper is an uh, enterprise blockchain company. We work with a lot of fortune companies and startups uh, in, on the enterprise blockchain side of it. But also we have uh, significantly invested uh, in a lot of other cutting edge technologies like AI, blockchain, cloud, big data, IoT, and a lot of manufacturing companies in industry 4.0. So what I essentially uh, believe is that uh, blockchain would essentially lay a right foundation for the uh, data computing or the data infrastructure uh, technology and all these other technologies would be built on top of that to solve a lot of uh, biggest problems which was you know, never solved before. Uh, and I think with all these combinations, we could essentially see uh, uh, you know, a future where internet is essentially evolving from an internet of information or to you know, internet of value and internet of trust. So we would be essentially you know, transferring value and you know, verifying all those values and data points at various various levels around the entire uh, internet uh, and the data economy, right? And I think uh, blockchain uh, would play a very, very important role. Uh, and we need to uh, have a really good uh, data infrastructure and the backbone in terms of security, in terms of how data would be used, in terms of all the uh, policies. And most importantly, what is the uh, best way to you know, uh, essentially reach there? So I'm not a big fan of centralization, though. I, I really support 100% decentralization. And I see that uh, peer to peer uh, or a data infrastructure of the with blockchain is kind of powered uh, uh, an economy where I think everybody, every individual just having a smartphone uh, and internet connection or a blockchain protocol would be the next uh, or would be essentially able to move value from uh, in all around the world. So yeah, thank you so much and really great, uh, great to be here. Thanks, Prashant. Uh, Mama Do? Turn on your microphone. Yeah. Let's do it. Uh, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, thank you for having me for this uh, panel. My name is uh, Mamadou Kujum Toure. I'm the founder of uh, Ubuntu Group. Uh, Ubuntu Group uh, involved um, uh, a series of uh, financial services. Uh, and in particular, well, we've launched uh, Ubuntu Tribe, which is a, a fintech company uh, focused on um, uh, democratizing access to digital gold. Uh, our vision is to harness uh, the natural resources uh, of, uh, of the earth in order to create shared abundance 
through a, a digital platform uh, that would allow ac uh, equal access to opportunities uh, for uh, the population. Um, and uh, the way we do that, uh, we put together um, uh, a digital platform and secured, uh, you know, uh, gold, gold resources across uh, the African continent and some other places in the world, and are making it available uh, for people to be able to trade. As you know, um, uh, you know, uh, you have three billion people uh, who don't have access to uh, the global economy because they don't have a credit card. But uh, one thing is sure is that gold is accepted everywhere. So what about digitizing gold? so that uh, you could foster and, uh, and bring those trillion people into the global economy uh, and uh, make it accessible to them through their mobile phones. So that's uh, what we're doing and it's powered by uh, uh, a social commerce platform that allows to build communities uh, and uh, to share you know, abundance knowledge, but also have access to basic services like um, you know, telemedicine, for instance, or online education that uh, without a credit card today you can't do uh, while you might be very needy of it. So this is our vision, this is what we do. Uh, clearly, uh, I'll come to that of course later, uh, none of that could be done without an adequate infrastructure, not only in Africa, but also an infrastructure that connects the regions. And if you look at uh, um, Asia, inclu um, you know, including India and, uh, and the African continent, you're talking about roughly out of the 7.7 .7 billion people, you're talking about closer to 5 billion. So clearly um, that, that there are some major opportunities for collaboration, integration of infrastructure and seamless blockchain solutions that allow those emerging markets to actually not only access the global economy, but create shared abundance. Thank you. Thanks, Mamadou. Uh, Monty, you might share with us an introduction about self. Thank you. Mike, please. Mike, please mute yourself, mute yourself please. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, who's the moderator, Rico? Me or you? Just so I know. You, you, you go for it. Uh, I'll tell you what, you've got a new career. You're very good. Uh, apologies to everyone, uh, including the audience, right. for being a bit late. Uh, I'm Monty Mumford, uh, currently uh, the co founder of Blockspeak, uh, blockspeak.io, uh, which is a conversation with, with myself uh, and, you know, so far, 12 of the biggest figures in finance, hedge funds, crypto Jesuses and blockchain specialists and, and all that stuff. I, I did check it. It's a great archive. A good, it's evergreen. There's some great things, but everyone's white, 11 men and one woman, So, uh, as, which is against my whole existence. Uh, so we obviously we need to raise our game on that one. Um, also a venture partner at 7BC based in Silicon Valley in London. Obviously, times are um, quite slow at the moment, but we're, we're moving on, raising our funds and, and, and sending out money. And previously, I've written a bit of columnist for Forbes. I still write for The Economist and the BBC when it comes to something I'm interested in. Telegraph, MIT Tech Review, Wired, Newsweek. I mean, you know, I've collected them all. Um, so a reasonable amount of, of um, uh, knowledge um, of, 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 of these sectors, especially fintech. Um, so I think you've all introduced yourselves to the audience. Um, I think I, I will probably just refer to you as I can see you, Rico, Presha, and Elizabeth Mamadou. I, I heard you speak, Mamadou. Thank you very much for that. Um, so Rico, I'm going to start with you. Okay. So where 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 do we sit here in this in this world that we're trying to change? What needs to be changed? You know, a digital infrastructure has been built, uh, and we all know about. Um, and PESA and in, in Kenya and, and, and other forms of technologies. Where are we at the moment with this digital infrastructure? Um, thanks for the question, uh, Monty. I was, I was very impressed with your background and I, I realized it's a real background. Um, so um, I'm gonna borrow some of your books about FinTech <laughs> later on. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, we have been working on um, tech development deals for the last uh, five to six years. And uh, my partner, Dunstan, has been working on quite a few uh, sovereign uh, blockchain technologies for a few countries, um, which is why we were quite um, experienced in the, in the sense of the architecture needed for most of the banking solutions. Um, right now, we are looking at launching a new protocol. It's called the FIDO protocol. It's a holistic ecosystem 
where we are going to have our own hardware nodes that is scalable, uh, very lightweight, um, so that um, we'll create a more um, decentralized um, consensus across the blockchain and we are able to solve some of the problems like DeFi issues with Ethereum, um, Ripple and whatsoever that, um, you know. Well I'm, well, I'm sure that you mentioned this in the introduction, um, Rico, yeah. without, without feeling too much um, about your company. Um, the point I sure. think is, but, but, but my question was, apart from where you stand, um, I'm happy to, 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 to listen to, to what you thought the problem was that you're trying to address. Well, the problem is about the uh, technologies um, that is really there for the enterprises, you know, um, for a digital infrastructure, so to speak. And of course, the challenges in terms of regulations uh, with the tri financial world that we have now, um, many, many people do not understand um, the advantages of having a digital um, currency or digital economy and how do we use that uh, to the advantage of managing the, the financials uh, of the companies, of government, of taxations, all these things can be done uh, with uh, the new fintech solutions we have. And most of the banks are still using dinosaur systems. Yeah, the, know, the legacy to, systems, right? Uh, very legacy systems. And they are having a lot of issues in integrating with the new apps and the way databases are being designed. Uh, so it is actually a very serious overhaul of the whole architecture in the banking systems. Yeah. And, and most of the banks, they are doing pretty well now. For example, yesterday we are, when we were having a panel with um, our colleague from Philippines, the Union Bank, yeah. they were one of the most advanced banks who are so into FinTech. And they even have their own Bitcoin ATM machines because for a lot of Philippines that they are overseas, they want to send money back. They want to use the Bitcoin um, to their own bank. Yeah. Um, so, that is an example of how some of the developing countries are able to pick up and develop technologies and bring it to the people and yeah. serve the people. And that's something that we are hoping to see in much more advanced countries, for example, in the United States, where things are so heavily regulated. Um, I, think, so I, think, I think when it comes to kind of countries that are leading the way in that type of Bitcoin, well, retail or where you can spend Bitcoin, I think a place such as Argentina, which has obviously had a load of problems with the with the, pay, with the pay. So it is miles ahead of any other country in its kind of yeah. Bitcoin adoption and the way that it can be used. I appreciate this is a Zoom call and I haven't spoken to the other three of you. So I probably will come to you in turn. But if you hear anything awesome or really fucking annoying, just put your hand up and I'll come to you next. Prashant, you're next on my list of uh, digital avatars ahead of, uh, ahead of the screen. Um, do you agree with that? How do you fit in with that? So I would, okay. So I would essentially like to uh, start this conversation uh, starting that what is essentially required for having a right digital payments infrastructure, right? I mean, there has been like, you know, we have been almost like almost 20, 25 years uh, since the inception of, you know, Silicon Valley, internet technologies. And I think almost a decade since the, you know, FinTech essentially took off. Uh, the, 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 one of the key challenges which I would feel at a very, very fundamental level is essentially how do we connect multiple parties uh, into a same ecosystem, right? I mean, let's say if I have to talk about moving money from A to B, or if I have to talk about, uh, you know, like lending, or if I have to talk about trade finance, or if I have to talk about any use case, the right infrastructure is not the infrastructure which just one company has. A right infrastructure is an infra infrastructure which is essentially interoperable like how many more bridges it could build, you know, uh, among uh, different, different participants all uh, across the ecosystem, that level, that trusted level of business network is fundamentally something which has been missing, uh, you know, in all these, uh, uh, you know, technologically advancements. And, and I think you're, you're talking, you're saying this on the kind of enterprise level, right? Really deep. Embedded. Uh, yeah. Okay. Back off. So, so for example, you know, we have been working with some of the uh, enterprises like, you know, uh, in the US uh, on the essentially title insurance, right? So whenever we buy any kind of properties, you have these banks and insurance companies providing you title insurance. And if you see, you know, like United States, we would always think that, okay, you know, they have 
best technology infrastructure in the world. But but the reality is unfortunately not that. So whenever a person has to buy a property or a land or do any bank transaction, they have to essentially go through an array of uh, intermediaries, which would just uh, you know establish that layer of trust. But again, one of the key challenges which uh, you know uh, you would always find is that okay you know like for example is fidelity connected with this insurance service provider or with this uh, you know uh, a title company the answer is really no and 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 that is one, and that is because you know why would a fidelity or why would some xyz would trust any other enterprise when we talk about the data infrastructure right they would say that okay what if you know uh, you would manipulate my data what if you steal my data what if you do so on so with my essentially a data right so essentially what really is needed in data infrastructure space is that a bridge you know a bridge which is built on the top of their uh, you know existing system and a bridge of trust a bridge which is providing trust as a service to this all enterprises uh, is something which i would say is required for any kind of an uh, you know use cases to essentially succeed uh, you know in terms of infrastructure There would, there would, there would be seem, seem to be two schools of thought, right? You either build on top of the infrastructure, number one, or you okay. get rid of it all and start again. Which one do you prefer? I think, I think the hybrid approach, right? You need to be really very agile when I talk about uh, essentially, you know, building these bridges. The first most important thing is we have to always think from very basics, like which is the biggest value I'm going to move about it, and how much does this value you know uh is essentially valued by how many stakeholders and that is the most important thing i mean determining that value of that data or that value of that bridge and what is being moved across is most important thing the other thing which you know uh, we would look at in an enterprise space is that what is the level of efficiency in terms of percentage or in terms of numbers we are able to achieve are we saying that okay we are able to achieve 10% 15% 20% 90% versus the roi uh, you know uh, over the years so and and most important thing is you know uh, i would always prefer an approach where i'm building this bridge on the top of their uh, existing systems rather than disrupting uh, all of that okay. Okay. i understood uh, lizzie yeah. i thought you were putting your arm up just then but you were just scratching your uh, scratching your ears like you'd like a, a, an auction saying oh have that 100 grand painting please um Prashant seems to me to be talking um, quite a lot of sense there. Would you agree that we should build on legacy systems or existing infrastructure, or should we start again? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good perspective. I think we're really lucky though in India because uh, we have a government that sort of put it out there as an agenda to be a digital economy. uh whatever that means and so um they are more willing than than many i was interested to hear your point about uh some countries in latam but i think people overlook what's happening in india the type of payments rails infrastructure that that our government has invested in from a purely public uh sector perspective over the last 5 years is completely unique in the world. So we have no use for products like Venmo or PayPal anymore because our government has created, you know, a P2P P2M instant free money transfer network that works really robustly. Uh, and sometimes I think, you know, people within India don't appreciate what a phenomenal piece of infrastructure that is and the amount of uh kind of railroads that we've been given to just build on top of um so so i i lived in india from 2008 to 2010 i lived on the job to get away from the last financial crisis i lived on the beach in goa with my wife and five year old and prashant i became yeah, a bollywood wow. film star I was in two movies you know wow. me too i've been i think... shot people i've been burnt to death on the worst actor in the world um that's just to give me some cred but, but in, those, in those times i was on set some of the most famous and even more i mean to be compared to Cody's now global star and no one had a uh, an iphone it was like you know three years later everyone had a blackberry um and they were they are no disrespect to those people but they weren't exactly set in a standard in adoption of kind of new technology mm -hmm. let alone mobile money so i'd be inter i'd be very interested to, on a personal basis back to know back. I'll, i'll always come back <laughs> <laughs> I've been in 25 times. Um so what was what was the, what happened five years ago was it a deregulation thing or, or or it was someone's particular vision what happened 
Yeah, it was a little bit of, of someone's particular vision. A guy called Nandan Nilakani, who uh, actually built one of the most successful listed companies that's ever come out of India, Infosys, uh, one of the yeah. co-founders. And he had a political ambition, uh, which is another story. But because of that, he had this great vision to create what's called India Stack, which was a stack of digital infrastructure to enable new digital businesses. The most controversial piece of that stack uh, is the global biometric identity system that we have, yes. um, which was a phenomenal enabler when it was you know, in its full swing. Um, and I know, you know, a lot of people here and a lot of Europeans get really shocked and outraged that a government would expect its entire population to put its biometrics into a database. But I think a lot of people aren't coming from the perspective of what's the, the give get, right? So I'll give my biometrics if that means I finally have access to my land records, if that means I finally get health records for the first time, if that means I can get free gas supply to my house. Right, like there's a really powerful incentive. No, 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 I agree and with so you. We... I remember speaking to um, a Rwandan woman, and I was going on about Rwanda and its lack of press freedoms, and she said, "You don't understand Africa." I mean, I've been to, I, I think I do understand it a bit. Um, she said, "You know, we don't really give a shit about press freedoms. You know, what I mean, we're more interested in food." And having the Western attitude can slightly, you know, it, India is mental, right? India is crazy. <laughs> Prashant, I'll come back to you now. Then I'll come to you, Mamadou. Um, in that it, it's impossible for India to work, but it does, right? And this would be another case in point. But, but you think that that changed things? Yeah, it did. It did. And I think to your point about your experience on, on set, um, what happened over the last five years is a bunch of consumer tech companies exploded. Yeah. And they had a lot of cash. Uh, they raised a lot of money from all over the world, billions. Um, and they used that to drive digital adoption. So, you know, the rate at which consumers came online and were comfortable doing digital transactions and doing all things digital, ha I think has been faster and more dramatic than pretty much any country in the world in the well, last well, five years. Well, right? I, obviously, I obviously need to kind of catch up with India. Prashant, before I come to you, Mamadou, um, you were raising your hand there in a very nice yeah. way. I wanted to tell what happened in India five, five years ago. What happened in India five years ago was Modi protocol, I Prime Minister's protocol, which essentially you know, changed the every payments. And I think the most important thing what India has is the access to the cheapest and the most fastest internet. Like I could have like just, I could just spend like $5 and I could just get like 50 gigabytes of like 4, 4G data at like super high speed, which essentially drove uh, faster uh, consumer adoption. But again, you know, in this entire stack, what we have, I think security uh, is one of the most important challenges. So we have the good, I mean, the best uh, and the most unique identity system, but it's again, you know, compromised to a lot of frauds. I mean, you could essentially go to the dark net and find, you know, every, uh, you know, billions of people's of data, which has been compromised. And I think that's the same side with it because India has been really good in building the technology. But when we talk about uh, the security aspects or the core uh, of it is something which is essentially, you know, uh, really, really, uh, you know, missing from my perspective. But, you know, what happened in India is we call it a Modi protocol. So it's just, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's just I think, I, think, yeah. I, think I would also add to that the fact, the kind of psychological effects on getting rid of the, the country's biggest bank note and people not trusting cash anymore. Was it 500 rupee notes, I think? I think that was a massive kind of, you know, cultural change, start, you know, especially for women who used to keep money away from their from their husbands. And suddenly they've got, you know, <coughs> small money. It's nowhere. Mamadou, man, it's sorry, dude, to keep you waiting. No, 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 I was, um, no problem. I was, I was a bit worried with the time. And, you know, the no, no, I'm, try, I'm trying my best. It's, it's all no a bit. Problem. We, you yeah. know, we have an adage in Africa that says, you know, until the lion learns to write, tales of the hunt shall glorify the, um, the hunter. Absolutely. So thank you for giving me the mic so I can share a few words. Um, Please do. Um, basically, wh what is critical here is uh, when we talk about fintech, uh, I think Africa has demonstrated over time um, it's the global leader in terms of mobile banking today and mobile payments, right? So if you take the, story, the success stories like M-Pesa, uh, but even more than that, what is interesting is that in the case of Kenya, mobile money kind of took uh, banking penetration from 26% in 2006 
to 80, 86% uh, in 2018. So, and the reason for that is unlike India, we didn't have infrastructure, right? So you need to send money if the roads are poor and you don't have a payment infrastructure, it forced our people to be creative, innovative and ingenious in terms of putting the right solution. If you look uh, today, what is interesting is that the big interest that you have for uh, by a big uh, uh, payment of fintech company like um, you know PayPal, um, you know who uh, if Visa and Mastercard who significant investment, but also Alibaba, who is invested in companies like Cash Up, right? And we talk about hundreds of millions of dollars of investment uh, in the fintech space that are keep on growing. But let alone that, which is um, the blockchain space, right? So today, uh, just note that out of the seven largest uh, on Bitcoin in the world, actually two to three countries are from Africa, which are Nigeria, South Africa, um, and, and Kenya, right? Um, so systematically monthly on a monthly basis. But even on a more concrete level, if you take Paxful, for instance, uh, who does this peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin, Africa is the largest market. And they added uh, last year alone in 2019, uh, close to 1 million customers, most of them coming from Africa. And it's the largest market in terms of average monthly transactions, $64 million per month only. And the reason is very simple, is that if you have only 30, 40% of people that are in bank and that want to access global economy, Therefore, Bitcoin or blockchain and digital currencies are the immediate fastest choice for them, right? Now, one of the challenge that, uh, that this poses, of course, how do you address the KYC, right? Yep. What has slowed down the banks in a significant way uh, in terms of penetrating the market based on... And that's why we developed uh, within our system with Ubuntu Tribe, a facial recognition model where... where within seconds can tap into 300 databases, 140 countries, uh, once you enter your idea and your recognition, so that we can do the KYC AML in a matter of seconds. And yeah. this way, why it becomes very interesting is that we, we leapfrog, and that's really where Africa has demonstrated its strength. And we leverage on that so that um, we can then get people to access this global economy. Here's the other problem, is that we're moving toward a digital economy where you buy everything online. Guess what? If you don't have a credit card, then you're out of the game, right? Now, the challenge, yes, sure, you can use Bitcoin, but it's very volatile, right? Yeah. Um, and not everybody accepts it. But guess one thing that Africa has and that the whole world wants and that the whole world needs is gold, 40% of the gold reserves globally, right? So that's why we decided to tokenize digital go the gold and make it um, an accessible, digital asset for as low as five cents to the dollar that people could get on their phone and start transacting globally. And which, which is a game changer. And that's how we've, we've been thinking the same way as, I, I made the first investment in the world in mobile banking, by the way, which was uh, 16 years ago, right? And yeah. strong of that, that understanding, the point is always to see, okay, what do we need? What do we have and what can we afford? And that's how mobile banking came. People don't have a bank account, but they have a mobile phone, right? Now we don't have credit cards. We don't necessarily have dollars, but we have gold. And we have blockchain and we, we can develop technologies that allow us to, to, um, to fit within the regulation. And that's what Ubuntu Tri is, is about. But you have many other cases that are coming. Uh, if you hear um, you know, the CEO of Twitter saying that he's moving to Africa in December, I'm sure you knew COVID-19 was coming, something because, <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't know, but it was I mean, too timely. No, but to, 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 to be fair, you've got it coming as well. We are starting a conspiracy and, theory, dear Bill. Well, I don't know, but uh, it's not only him, but it was, it was put on, and guess what? He said, Africa is the future of digital currency. He spent a few, a few weeks there, talking to a lot of my friends in the tech space and engaging. And the reason is simple, is that, for us, it's easier to leapfrog. We don't, get, we don't have to go against a system and we're starting from a clean slate. Now, but I think this is the, this is the whole kind of um, reputation, especially of technology. It's a little bit of a, a cliched one as well, right? The Africa's, you know, piggybacked and all that stuff. I think there's other things to be said about M-Pesa 
because I, I know someone who's on the pilot scheme for Vodacom, Vodacom and I spoke to her. I said, you know, it's 10 year anniversary. Was it last year? I think, you know, it must be fantastic. You know, 40% of Kenyan GDP and all that stuff. And she said, no, it's actually not good at all because M-Pesa now has a reputation of crushing any other new newcomers coming into the, into the market. It's not as like this. We see M-Pesa as it, it changed Western banking, but, yeah. but at home, it's seen as a place that stifles innovation. No, actually, uh, it's, it comes from um, a de facto historical monopoly that has nothing to do with M-Pesa, but that is linked with Safaricom. They were yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Okay. And well, they have eighty percent market shares on the telecom, and it's exclusive. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. The beauty about coming with a product like Ubuntu Tribe, it's network agnostic, right? Yeah. Um, and what what is all the more interesting is that it also helps develop the local economy. Five percent of transaction fees are used to build schools and communities with the mining. Yeah, no, I, I like the idea. I like the idea of mining for Bitcoin, mining for gold. And, and after this call, um, I, I want to let's uh, connect. So I'd, I'd like you to introduce you to someman that might be able to help. Uh, thank you, okay. thank you. Very Blue side kind of I'm glad I came. <laughs> you know, well, you got one business. And I'm glad you saved the best for last. Uh, hopefully, you know. You know that. You guys, you know, I, I had to find a nice joke to. Is that, I think he's at his moment. Pico, <laughs> Rico, Rico, Pico. So, Rico, I'm sorry, talking man. about Rico, of course. As my, uh, as my, as someone who's probably moderating this uh, better than me, um, what would you say to uh, Mama Do there? What, what, what's kind of your take on that? <laughs> well, I, I'm actually an advisor to Mama Do's project, so we've been working on um, Ubuntu oh, Tribe for quite some time, and definitely uh, we have been supporting him and, and making sure that you know, I, I, I told him before that. I don't mind moving to Africa in the next five or ten years' time because I see the huge potential of the African market in terms of GBD growth in the next ten years. And same in India as well with Prashan and Lizzie. These two regions will have the biggest economic growth in the next ten to twenty years yeah, okay. compared to what we see in China or Southeast Asia. I lived in China for the last twelve years, and I had a culture shock when I went back to Malaysia because I'm a Malaysian. Yeah, and I still need to carry my cash and credit card around. But in fact, when I was China for the last five years, I hardly use any fiat. Yeah, everything is done on my phone. Uh, I, I think I think that's been accelerated by the by the plague, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, having an authoritarian a government with a, a bit of democratic characteristics does make a lot of changes in how they they roll out the whole, you know financial system. And now they are launching the central bank digital currency, CBDC. Yeah. It's, it's actually not really useful. I think what the CBDC does for China is actually encouraging the, the usage of digital yuan outside of China, yeah. rather internally, because everyone is using it already. It's just a figure. Well, I think, I think, I think what, we, what we need to realize, what, what, what maybe our audience should know, is that the whole kind of Bitcoin, crypto, the part, it's part of the global financial system is so infinitesimally small, you know what I mean, at the moment. It's not like the biggest deal in the world, you know what I mean? Um, and, and maybe we should put this into perspective if, if we're going to have a kind of conversation about, you know, crypto. Um, Lizzie, you're based in India or are you based in, in the UK? Yeah, no, no, in India, Bangalore. Bangalore. You can hear the storm outside. <laughs> Bangalore. Bangalore, yeah. Must be it must be coming up to monsoon, no? It is right now. I can I, any minute now. There's going to be a flash of lightning. Oh, that is that is just the best time in the whole world when the monsoon. Breaks. <laughs> I have to say, um, we seem to have lost. I think we've lost our friend. I don't know where he's gone. Um, so so, let's kind of put it into a topical kind of time sense of time. Um, and I know we've seen stories, especially in India, of you know migrants walking home and this kind of old Indian stories, you know, the <laughs> primitive stories compared to, to, to the financial system, as, as, you, as, you, as you've just said. What, what kind of effect do you think COVID will have on adoption? How do you think, how do you think that will accelerate things or decelerate things yeah. or what will it do? No, I think, I think it's going to be dramatic. Um, I think we're going to see a, a massively sped up, futuristic view brought forward 
Uh, Morgan Stanley actually published a research report today where they revised all their digital adoption numbers uh, yep. forward by about five years. Yep. So digital penetration is going to explode in their mind in India. And I think it's true. I think what we're seeing is for the first time, people have actually had to really think carefully about being in crowded public spaces, right? It's never been something that was feared before. Um, and, you know, a lot of what we do for fun is be in public crowded spaces. So if we can recreate that in a digital environment and uh, pay digitally, it's it's going to happen and it's happening at an incredible pace. I, I... The other thing is, this is a really young and very like optimistic type of economy, right? Like you said, we're going to see some of the best GDP growth over the next decade in the world. Um, so people are still, they have a ridiculously high level of consumer confidence and optimism right now, which means they're going to be even more willing to try out digital products. And, and we're definitely seeing well, I think, uh, increased I think rates. Of from my visits in India going back to the mid eighties, you know what I mean? You're never alone in India. <laughs> Even if you go for a piss behind a rock, oh, there's some guy there. Or something, you know what I mean? So anything I suppose that will help with that. Prashant, obviously, you know, where are you based, Prashant? I'm based in uh, Hyderabad, which is again uh, on the south, like quite close. Yeah, yeah, to no, yeah. yeah. Uh, and and would you agree? I suppose you and Lizzie, it's, it's pretty much we've got Rico who advises for my mum and do. So you're you're like two of the same, and then you two are based in India and two kind of high tech cities. It's like I'm, I'm dealing with one person here, which is quite interesting. Um, so would you just, would you back up what Lizzie said there, that, 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 that COVID has accelerated everything? Actually, see, uh, what I have a little bit uh, mixed opinion here because uh, I think, see, uh, the top, uh, so if you look at the Indian economy, right? I mean, let's go uh, with statistics, right? There are 50% uh, population in India, which is the middle class and and then, you know, you have other majority of the population, which is having this transition from low uh, or, you know, low income category to middle income category. And I think this transition is really, really affected uh, by the COVID scenario because people are having uh, job cards, uh, that is, you know, pay cards, et cetera, et cetera. So these, uh, you know, lower people or a lower income category people where, you know, I think everybody is like really, really bullish about because looking at the uh, massive uh, Indian population, I think a 10% would of a, a 1 billion would make a huge, huge difference. And I think that is really, really affected. So in a short term, probably we could see uh, a lot of shifts uh, in the, you know, uh, consumer trends, consumer behaviors. Uh, but, but what I see is that there would be a tremendous rise where people would be investing into global asset classes or uh, global yeah. Uh, technology companies because Indian investment scenario has been purely traditional, right? I mean, most of the Indians would still invest in some government or public sector companies than probably investing into a highly uh, technology driven company. Uh, or or uh, gold, or gold. Yeah, or gold. For instance, just saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so probably, you know, some asset watch, you know, Mamado is creating, I think probably could have a great utility because we could go back in times where we are using a deflationary, uh, uh, you know, probably like form of money. And I think Bitcoin would have a tremendous value specifically in markets like India, because I see there's going to be a tremendous capital control measures with governments all around the world is, uh, uh, you know, essentially gonna take. So, so I, I am I'm really optimistic about India. But what I feel is that unless and until a basic amenity is like you know education and the right infrastructure and all of that is essentially you know fulfilled with this lower income category people, I think country might have a quite tough time going forward. I think I think there's quite a lot of difference between kind of cryptocurrencies and digital fiat. Although that's probably for another uh, another panel. Uh, for another day. Um, maybe as we kind of come to the end, I mean, I'll just give you a small story. I was one of the people that was quite scared about this plague. So I filled up my car with petrol. I put some petrol into the into the two cans, put them in the shed, got in touch with my mate who's got access to guns um, and took out about £15,000 in cash from the bank just in case it got a bit weird. Do you know what I mean? Um, in the time that's elapsed, obviously, uh, no one wants to use cash because um, there's a chance of getting, you know, uh, the virus from cash. Um, and it didn't go as badly as I thought. So I had to go back to the bank last week and just sheepishly give them my cash back to put in the bank. So it would be OK. Uh, so that was my slightly ridiculous uh, way of doing it. Uh, Rico, um, are we seeing the end of cash here? 
it's I mean, or has it already happened? I think in certain countries it already happened. Um, during the COVID nineteen time, I think more people are using digital cash and and credit cards, uh, NFC or Wave, rather than using fiat. Even the governments are encouraging people not to use currency. Currency. Um, on our end, we were looking at uh, tracking transactions, and because we realized in the middle of all this pandemic, we were a lot of people are having problems trading um, PPEs and medical supplies globally and, and facilitating a trade. So um, we had a new social media platform built on the blockchain, which means that um, it's similar to a Facebook or Twitter, uh, except all the tech they have is now built on a blockchain. So we yeah. just launched it about two weeks ago. It's called spantrack.com uh, and you can track all your transactions on digitally. Um, where buyer and seller can verify a transaction on a blockchain. So that's something that we are building on a you know, social media platform in the midst of this pandemic. The idea just came about and we just say, while everyone is sitting at home, our coders and developers are just sitting at home, just do it. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. Um, yeah. Mama, have you done? have you come up with some similar fantastic ideas after your first mobile investment all those years ago? Have you been sitting around resetting your brain, thinking of some brilliant ideas like Rico to change the world? Yes, certainly. We have, uh, we have a, few, um, a few that came up. One is called the uh, Ubuntu Love Challenge that has nothing to do with digital, but that would uh, ultimately allow people to digitally um, spread the love frequency. But I'll do that on my next speech tomorrow. Oh, well, believe... something, something for the audience to look forward to. Lizzie, end of cash, end of rupees. What do you think? Not for a while. <laughs> no, <I don't. laughs> but we're getting again. Uh, okay. Prashant, no, I, I, believe, I believe we'll go back though to. I have a little different opinion, but I love cash. Cash is the most amazing form of money. <laughs> and and I, I think. Who has cash in these times, I think, uh, is really important because you just cannot manage. I mean, in India, you're like caught like drunk, right? You need cash. I just cannot say a cop, you know what? I'm <laughs> saying it's like drink and cash. drive. <laughs> Doesn't matter how to fix that. <laughs> is that how it works in India now? <laughs> I didn't know. I don't drink. So I think, I think cash is really important and you need cash for sure to manage certain part of the economy and certain part of things because I think it's really important, you know, to hide something, uh, you know, uh, you know, around because it has its own advantages and I think you could use cryptos for that. So, but, but I think cash is important and I think cash should stay there because it's, it's this amazing form of money. I just love it. I uh, just want to make one last point. One last yeah. point, if you allow me quickly. Uh, I think it's important also to understand what's going on globally. Yeah. Uh, before we go full digital, there's a few there are a few countries that are going back to gold. Yeah, so China, Russia, and India have been the biggest buyers of gold over the past ten years. The, the digital currency that China is actually putting in place is partially backed by gold. So we're gonna uh, we, and we're gonna see uh, in this time of crisis and probably deflation, hyperinflation making actual cash, good luck, keep it. I'm not sure what you're gonna do with it except painting, but technically, uh, for my, that's why it's from, uh, from my friend Prashant, technically you're gonna, you, you, you should have the transition period where people will go back to what they know. And what they've known and that has worked until 1971 was currencies that were backed by gold. So you, and therefore, if you go digital, digital becomes the de facto non-national Opportunity for people and yes, people I, the, access to gold. I, I, the non-national thing. It's quite. It's quite an interesting statistic. I know, Sergio, going to. I know we have to come to an end, but all these kind of like leading national currencies they last for a hundred years, right? So we've got we've had the dollar for nearly a hundred years. It's ready to change. For the hundred years before that, we had sterling. For the hundred years before that, we had the French franc. 100 years before that, we had the Dutch Gilder, and before that, we had the kind of Spanish to Portuguese Escudo. So when the June. Next is going to be Ubuntu. Yeah, no. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Sergey, can we have one last question to everyone, or are we out of time? 
You know, I, I really love your mood. I, I really get excited to your conversation here today. It's really happy. I'm really having fun with you. <laughs> Just why I don't know why I do being connected with you as well. Now, what's the point? Do we accept electronic cash or just paper cash? I, I see that India accept only paper, nothing else. I see that uh, in Africa, they love gold, only gold as assets, as metal. And in, in the whole Chinese, world love gold. Across yes. civilization. I know about that, system. yes. <laughs> I think the answer is quite simple here. I think just Bitcoin. I That's see. it. Yeah. I got your point. Guys, we have to finish this great session as well. <laughs> yes. I want to no thank you all of you. Thank you very much, Sajay. It's really amazing, amazing session, amazing audience.